Welcome back to our June sermon series titled Prayer Warriors of Old. The message this morning is titled The Man Who Cried for God to Come Down. Today we're talking about the prophet Isaiah and let's hear from our text in Isaiah 63 verse 15 and we're going to go through Isaiah 64 and verse 12. Isaiah is praying and he says this to God. Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation. Where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? The stirrings of your heart and your compassion are restrained towards me. For you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. Why, O Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Your holy people possessed your sanctuary for a little while. Our adversaries have trotted it down. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who were not called by your name. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things which we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. For from days of old they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices in doing righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. Behold, you were angry for we sinned. We continued in them a long time, and shall we be saved? For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name, who arouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay and, and you are our potter and all of us are the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Behold, look now, all of us are your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praised you has been burned by fire and all our precious things have become a ruin. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, friends, in the early years of my ministry, I attended some preacher conferences and seminars because it's easy when you're beginning to kind of feel overwhelmed with the demands of ministry, and I was looking for any help that I could get. But you know, as I attended these things, I soon began to realize that such conferences typically offered some method or strategy for ministry, but they, they left me feeling a little empty, and ultimately, I didn't really think they were that helpful. And years later, I read a book by uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones called Revival. And you know, I agree with Dr. Lloyd-Jones, who observed that never before has the church had so many methods available to us, but at the same time, so little experience of the power of God. And of course, he said that Christians need to know the living God in a deeper way, and I, I totally agree with that. And you know, this is kind of in the background of this prayer we just heard from Isaiah. You see, through the God's of spirit, through God's spirit, the prophet Isaiah saw a desperate future in Israel's history. And because Isaiah predicted conditions that would take place about 100 years after he wrote, after the Babylonians would conquer Judah, I believe that God was revealing the future to the prophet Isaiah and was leading him to pray this prayer that we just heard as a, a gracious way of teaching us how to lay hold of God and, and God's power in time of great need. 
You see, Isaiah pictures God as shut up in the heaven and removed from his people who are suffering because of their sin. And in this emotional outburst, the prophet calls upon God to rend the heavens and come down in great power, even as he did at Sinai, to restore his people and to make his name known amongst the nations. From this prayer, we learn that those who feel the lack of God's working should cry out to him to come down in power to make his name known. You know, we're thinking about prayer in this series, and we might call Isaiah's prayer revival praying. And I want to suggest that our text this morning reveals five characteristics of revival praying. So let's think about that together. The first thing we see about revival praying is that it begins when some of God's people feel the lack of God's working in our day. You know, there's a mood to this prayer, right? The mood of this prayer is Isaiah's overwhelming sense of the the desperate situation of God's people. He feels as if God is up in heaven and not even noticing what's happening. You see, God's former power is not being experienced in the same way. And so Isaiah says, where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? His former mercies are not known. See, Isaiah boldly complains that God's being emotionally cold towards the people. He even says that God's cities have become a wilderness. The temple is burned to the ground and trodden underfoot. None of God's people, he says, are calling on his name. They're all under the power of their sin. It's as if the people... Isaiah sees had never been under God's rule or called by his name at all, he says in verse 19. See, Isaiah deeply feels the desperate need of God's people, and so he he prays with this great urgency and a strong emotion. I don't know if you know this, but complacency, complacency amidst the existing low spiritual condition amongst God's people is the enemy of revival. You might remember the lukewarm church at Laodicea. They were content And yet they were also wretched and miserable and poor and blind. You know, I know of two ways to keep myself from lapsing into lukewarmness and and thinking that that's kind of a normal thing. First, we really must steep ourselves in the Bible so much that when you hear of the worldliness of the modern church, you become appalled. I I know how the world is today. We're we're tempted to spend our time watching TV and movies and, and all the worldliness that comes with that will flavor the view of what we have for what's normal. You will hear of worldliness in the church and we just shrug it off as no big deal. See, God's word must shape our worldview. But the second thing is, We really must read church history and read some of the great men and women of God from the past. As we do so, we learn how God has worked in history and and we'll read people who were not so tainted by our modern worldview. The fact that they wrote in a different time and culture will often kind of jar us to see how far we've drifted away from God's holiness. And, And that can be the start of revival praying when some of God's people begin to feel the lack of his working in our day. This leads me to a second characteristic of revival praying here from Scripture. Revival praying lays hold of God as he's revealed himself. You know, Isaiah knew God as revealed in his word, and he laid hold of God and appealed to him based on his holy and gracious nature. Matthew Henry comments on this, and he says, The most prevailing arguments in prayer are those that are taken from God himself. You know, that's what Isaiah does. His prayer is kind of a lesson in applied theology as he teaches us a number of things about the the character of God. And I would suggest, friends, that, that, that to pray as Isaiah prayed, we need a correct understanding of who God is. I want us to notice four things. The first thing we see in Scripture is God is holy. And he's a glorious God who dwells in heaven. And Isaiah knows this. He says in in chapter 63, verse 15, he says, Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation. You see, Isaiah recognizes that there's a great gulf between himself and God. Here Isaiah is down on earth below. God is in heaven above. And God must look down to behold things here. And so Isaiah begins his prayer as Jesus instructed us. In essence, he says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. You might remember years earlier, the prophet Isaiah had had a vision of the Lord in heaven. In Isaiah 6, he said this, he said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. He says, seraphim stood above God, each having six wings. With, With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, 
holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah records, the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. This vision of Isaiah's was a a devastating and yet transforming experience for Isaiah. And so that now when he comes before God, he recognizes the great separation between himself as a sinful creature and God and his glorious holiness. And so he approaches him with the proper humility. I know this is tough for us today as modern people. There's a book by Leonard Griffith called This is Living, and here's what Griffith wrote about this idea. He says, too often we start to pray at the wrong place. Interesting opening line, isn't it? Too often we start to pray at the wrong place, he says. He continues, he says, prayer should begin not with ourselves, but with God. A conscious awareness that we stand before God as creatures before the Creator, as subjects even before the King, as servants before the Master, like children before the Heavenly Father. It's an interesting idea. We start with God and we need to understand who we are before Him. And then he continues. He says, a university student burdened by a personal problem, spent an hour with Philip Brooks, the great Boston preacher. It says, when he returned to the college, a friend asked him, he said, well, what did you guys talk about? Or, or, or maybe more to the point, dear friend, what did Dr. Brooks say about your problem? Well, the student looked surprised. And he said for a moment, you know, I totally forgot to mention it. He said, isn't that odd? I totally forgot to ask Dr. Brooks about my problem. Well, the friend or the roommate said, well, why ever not? You went expressly for that purpose. And the student said, well, it didn't seem to matter anyway when I talked with Philip Brooks. You see the point here, right? That should be the effect of prayer. And it will be the effect if we come consciously into the presence of God. And so here's how prayer works. Before ever becoming a recital of our own problems, prayer is a kind of devotional exercise where something really important happens, right? We lose ourselves in God. And it's like we rise from our mortality up into the eternity of God. Uh, We go from our smallness to his greatness. We go from our weakness to his power. And this is what Isaiah does. And this is why Isaiah can pray the way he's praying. He's going from his humility up into the greatness of God. So he remembers God's character. Well, what else can we say about God? in prayer. Well, God is the mighty God who acts with awesome power. That's why there's these rhetorical questions in chapter 63. He says in verse 15 in the prayer, where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence as the fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. See, Isaiah knew God as the mighty God. And when he comes down in his power, everyone trembles before him. You see what Isaiah is doing? He's referring back to something that he knew about God. Isaiah is referring here to God's power as revealed in the Exodus. Remember in the Exodus, right? God had performed signs and wonders in Egypt. He had parted the Red Sea and led 
his people safely across. He actually closed the sea on top of Pharaoh and his pursuing army. He, he led his people to Mount Sinai where he called Moses up the mountain to himself to give the Ten Commandments. And if you remember on that awesome occasion, God warned that neither man nor beast should come near the mountain lest they would die. And there was thunder and lightning and the mountain was covered in a thick cloud and smoke. And there was the sound of a loud trumpet and the whole mountain shook violently. You know, the Exodus in the Old Testament is a type of God's power in redeeming his people. That type, that type is fulfilled at the cross of Christ. It takes the same mighty power of God to save a lost soul from Satan's domain as it did to deliver Israel from Pharaoh's domain. You see, revival praying calls upon the mighty God to come down with power to transform the hearts of hardened sinners. We also learn from God's word and through Isaiah that God is the, the sovereign God who judges sin. You know, here in chapter 63 and verse 17, Isaiah asks a, a really bold question. He says, why, O Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? What's Isaiah saying? We say Isaiah recognizes that God has established that moral law in which sin hardens the heart and does so by divine design. Now Isaiah is not blaming God for Israel's sin nor making God the author of sin. Rather, he is affirming that God righteously has judged his sinning people by giving them the fruit of their ways. Now what does that mean for us practically? Well, beloved, it is a terrible and a dangerous thing for God's people to be disobedient. For sometimes God actually punishes our disobedience, not only by turning his face from us, but also by leaving us to ourselves. But he even seems to drive us into sin and into error and into a hardness of heart. Be careful how you treat God, my friends. You may say to yourself, well, I can sin against God and then, of course, I can repent and go back and find God whenever I want him. Well, you can try that. And you will sometimes find that not only can you not find God, but that you do not even want to. You will become aware of a terrible hardness, a callousness in your heart. And then you suddenly realize that it is God punishing you in order to reveal your sinfulness and your vileness to you. And so when we come to God in prayer for revival, we must see that God is the holy and glorious God who dwells in heaven. He is the mighty God who acts with awesome power. He is the sovereign God who judges sin, sometimes by allowing sin to take its hardening course in our lives. But you know, that's not the end of the story. It's also true that God is the gracious, compassionate Father who will restore us. That's why he prays this way in Isaiah 64, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah says, For you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Behold, look now, all of us are your people. You see what Isaiah is doing is he's laying hold of God as the gracious, compassionate father of his people who will restore them. No matter how much they've sinned, if they will turn back to him and cry out for mercy. As Isaiah 55, verses 6 and 7 puts it, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. You see, dear friends, revival praying knows God as the holy and glorious and mighty and sovereign God who judges sin, but also as the gracious Father who will forgive and restore when we turn back to him. And thus revival praying begins when some of God's people feel the lack of his working in our day, and it lays hold of God as he's revealed himself. And then thirdly, revival praying openly confesses sin. 
and it vindicates God's righteous judgments. Listen to chapter 64, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah prays, he says, For all of us become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who arouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the power of our iniquities. You know, Isaiah doesn't blame God, but rather confesses the people's sin and acknowledges sin's devastating effects because of God's righteous judgment. You know, one mark of revival is that God's people stop blaming God or others for their sin, and they own up to it for what it is. Martin Lloyd-Jones points out that people hate the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of God's wrath. And he also emphasizes that a sure sign of revival is that people begin to groan and agonize under a conviction of sin. They become so conscious of their unworthiness and wretchedness that they feel they cannot live. You know, some who have been Christians for years begin to doubt whether they have ever been Christians. Why? Because a fallen sinner cannot draw near to a holy God without becoming even more conscious of his own sinfulness. Now, I've had Christians tell me, Matthew, I grew up in an abusive home. I was always put down. I don't need to see how sinful I am. I need to focus on how much God loves me so that I can build up my self-esteem. I understand, but there's a mixture of truth and error in those words. The truth is, we are new creatures in Christ, and we should not dwell on what we were in Adam, but rather on what we are now in Jesus Christ. But the errors are that we are to build our self-esteem and ignore our sinfulness. Rather than focusing on ourselves, we are now to see ourselves in Christ so that we esteem Him and extol His grace and love. And the fact is, dear friends, the closer you draw to God who is light, the more you see the darkness of your own sinful heart. If you truly know Christ, this will not drive you to despair, but it will cause you to be on guard against your own propensity towards sin and to glory all the more in the cross of Christ, where His grace freely flows. Show me a person close to God, and I'll show you a person who is painfully aware of their own sins and quick to confess and forsake them. This brings me to a fourth idea about revival praying, that it's motivated by God's glory. I want you to notice the devastation which sin brings the people of God in Isaiah's prayer. He says, cities where people had enjoyed life, where children had laughed and played in the streets, were destroyed. The people were slaughtered or carried off into slavery in a foreign land. Even God's temple, where his people had sung his praises, was burned and in ruins. But in spite of all this pain, Isaiah didn't pray this, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down to make us all happy once again. No. He doesn't pray like that. You see, Isaiah, like all who pray effectively, was motivated by something higher than man's happiness. He was moved to pray because he wanted God to be glorified. He wanted God's name to be known. He wanted the nations to tremble in God's presence. Even so, those today who pray for revival, they must be moved above all by the fact that God's honor is tarnished because of the sins of his people. We must pray for God's glory to be revealed so that the nations may tremble in his presence. This brings me to the fifth and final thing about revival praying. Revival praying understands and lays hold of God's grace. You know, there's a strange irony in Isaiah's prayer. He openly confesses the great sin of God's people. And yet at the same time, he boldly appeals to God to act on their behalf. He prays some pretty gutsy things here. He says, God, you've closed up your heart towards me. You've caused us to stray from your ways. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? Wow, how can he say these things? Well, I think because Isaiah understood that we don't come to God based on our merit, but based on his unmerited favor. You see, God's grace never gives us warrant to sin so that grace might abound. Isaiah here points out that God acts on behalf of the ones who wait for him. He meets with the one who rejoices in doing righteousness, who remembers God and his ways. 
You see, beloved, God's abundant grace should motivate us not to sin. But his grace also means that if we do sin, if we will turn from our sin back to God, he, like the father of the prodigal son, will come running to meet us with open arms. He's that kind of God. I conclude with this, a man by the name of Del Fessenfeld, who was the founder of Life Action Ministries, used to ask a very searching question. If revival in this land depended on your prayers, your faith, and your obedience, would we ever experience revival? You know, today we see many of God's people who are hurting. Many are in captivity to sin. Many churches are offering worldly programs and techniques and counsel to heal the wound of God's people superficially. But true healing can only come when the living God moves powerfully in hearts to convert sinners and to bring repentance and revival to his people. We need to join Isaiah in praying, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. May God bless us as we pray that prayer this week. Amen.